origin of species was Darwin right? Well, I'll give you a guess at what the National Geographic said when they asked a similar question on their cover story article in November of 2004. Was Darwin wrong? Uh, they made it clear that he was not wrong, that he was right, and they presented the same arguments that they've been presenting for decades. Nothing new there. But uh, it was only a few months later that Discover Magazine joined the chorus and said, Testing Darwin, scientists at Michigan State prove evolution works. Now, if you didn't open the magazine to read the article, you would think science has just overwhelmingly confirmed Darwin's theory. But you open the article and the very first sentence says this, Digital organisms, that is, those created in a computer program, not real organisms, just digital ones, that breed thousands of times faster than common bacteria are beginning to shed light on some of the biggest unanswered questions of evolution. So I guess they didn't prove it. All they did was shed light on some of the biggest questions. Well, the National Academy of Sciences is the highest uh, scientific body in our country, and they published a book in 1998 that was sent out to science teachers around the country teaching about evolution and the nature of science. And in this book, they said, there is no debate within the scientific community over whether evolution has occurred, and there is no evidence that evolution has not occurred. I want you to notice two things in that statement. First of all, they say, there is no debate in the scientific community about evolution. What's the implication of that sentence? It is that if you don't believe in evolution, it's proof positive you're not a scientist. Because all scientists agree about evolution. And then the second thing they say is that there's no evidence that evolution has not occurred. Now, for those of you who remember eighth grade English grammar, you will know that that is a double negative. Uh, that's not a very strong statement. They could have said there are mountains of evidence that evolution has occurred. But they make the weaker statement, there's no evidence that it hasn't occurred. But they're very dogmatic here. Well, the theory of evolution can be represented by what I like to call the evolution tree of life. In fact, the evolutionists even talk about this. The evolutionists believe that the, uh, the first living cell evolved, popped into existence by chance uh, from non-living matter. And then over millions of years of reproduction, coupled with natural selection and mutation, which we'll talk about a little later, that single-celled creature diversified into all the different plants and animals that we see on the planet today. So everything is descended from a common ancestor. Now, the evolution theory is based on some assumptions. And uh, we call this philosophy or this assumption naturalism. And there are two main assumptions in naturalism. And this is the philosophy that controls modern science. The first is that nature or matter is all that exists. And the second is that everything can and must be explained by three things, time and chance and the laws of nature. If you have those three things, time and chance and the laws of nature, the evolutionists say you can explain everything in the living world and indeed everything in the universe. But do all scientists believe in evolution? Consider this statement and uh, think who might have said it. The influence of evolutionary theory on fields far removed from biology is one of the most spectacular examples in history of how a highly speculative idea for which there is no really hard scientific evidence can come to fashion the thinking of a whole society and dominate the outlook of an age. The author goes on, ultimately the Darwinian theory of evolution is no more nor less than the great cosmogenic, what's that word? Myth. Myth of the 20th century. Now, who said that? Well, many people uh, have imagined that it was said by a very articulate but scientifically ignorant uh, Southern Baptist preacher from Alabama. But actually, it wasn't. It was said by Michael Denton, who at the time of writing his book, Evolution, A Theory, and Crisis, in 1985, he was an agnostic. He wasn't sure whether there's a God or not. And in the book, he didn't cite one Bible verse to support his conclusion. Rather, he discussed biological, paleontological, and microbiological evidence to lead him to the conclusion that the uh, Darwinian theory of evolution 
is a myth. But Michael Denton is not the only scientist who has been raising scientific criticisms of evolution. In the last 40 years, there's been, uh, there have been a number of books, and they've been coming at a little faster clip. And you'll notice one thing about the dates of all these. They were published before 1998, when the National Academy of Science, as I just quoted, said there was no debate in the scientific community. Uh, furthermore, these are non-scientists who have been raising scientific criticisms against evolution. Many of these authors are lawyers. Lawyers are highly trained to discern when somebody is manipulating the evidence to lead to a faulty conclusion. They're experts in logic. And they, uh, in these writings, uh, accept the scientific observations that the evolutionists say, but argue they don't add up to support the theory. In addition, there has been in the last 40 years the growth of what we call biblical creationists. And many people think that biblical creationists are only in the United States, but actually they're all over the world. The Answers in Genesis ministry began in Australia uh, in 1978. Uh, there's a creation science organization in Russia with Ph.D. members. Uh, Korea actually has the largest creation organization in the world with over 2,000 members and uh, many of them with Ph.D.s or university teaching positions. In fact, there was an article back in 2000 in the secular weekly science journal, New Scientist, all about the creation scientists. And they had this map showing that uh, there are over 30 countries of the world that have at least one creation science organization in them. So this is a worldwide movement. Now, just as the evolutionists have some presuppositions from which they build their theory, so do creationists. And those presuppositions come from the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, we are told that on the third day of creation, God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind. And that phrase, after their kind, appears two more times in relationship to the creation of the plants. And then in uh, verse 21, on day 5, the sea creatures were created after their kind and the birds after their kind. And then on day six, the beasts of the earth, the cattle, the creeping things were created after their kind. This phrase, after their kind or after its kind, appears in Genesis 1 ten times. And the repetition is emphatic. God is saying that he made different kinds of creatures to reproduce after their kind. Not to change from one kind into a different kind. And then there's one more important passage, and that's in Genesis chapter 6 where God tells Noah to take uh, of every living thing uh, two of every kind. And here again we see this phrase, after their kind, repeated three times in verse 20. So from these verses, we can make a model for the creation view of the origin of, of living things. And that is what I like to call the creation forest of life, in contrast to the evolution tree of life. God created the different kinds of plants and animals, distinct uh, he built into their genetic information potential for variety within the kind, but not the ability to change from one kind into another. And so over the 1600 years leading up to the flood, they did produce variety within their kind. Then God told Noah to take two of every kind of land, animal and bird onto the ark. And uh, so he did. He didn't take two of every variety, but two of every kind. And then they came off the ark. And uh, they multiplied, and in the uh, almost 4,000 years since the flood, they've had more time to diversify into more varieties in uh, the post-flood world. So, which of these views of living things is correct? The evolution tree of life or the creation forest of life? Which view is supported by the scientific evidence? Now, in answering this question, we need to keep in mind two very important questions. One is... How did the DNA information for the supposed first living microscopic creature come into existence? And then secondly, how did the DNA information in that simple creature get changed and augmented to produce all the different kinds of plants and animals that we see in the fossil record and living on the earth today? So to begin with, let's